Hello, and welcome to When Words Collide. My name is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. I am broadcasting this live from my hometown, uh, Lavac, Onaping Falls in Ontario, in mid-northern Ontario. And this was the library branch where I first discovered the magic of what happens when words collide. I've got a live audience here in the Lavac Public Library. And special hello to the folks who are watching this on the live stream. If you're watching it because it's going to be online later, well, hello to you people in the future who are watching this later. But we are excited. This is a special part of when words collide. And normally, pre-pandemic, we would have been in Calgary, Alberta. And this would have been an event that we held just prior to the launch of When Words Collide. And we would get all of our amazing guests of honor, go to the Calgary Public Library, and we would be doing a reading there. But we are doing it virtually. So from the comfort of their own homes, uh, three of our special guests of honor are going to be available to do readings tonight. They will do a reading. And of course, uh, there will be an opportunity for you to post your comments and questions. I've got live people who may be asking questions as well here. And I am going to, without further ado, bring us up to the very first guest. I do have to announce that Hank Philippi Ryan had uh, an unexpected conflict and was unable to do the reading uh, this evening. She's going to be doing the readings tomorrow on Friday prior to the, the keynotes where all four guests will be able to do their keynotes. And I will have a, 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 a more solid Wi-Fi connection tomorrow. <laughs> because I am doing this remotely, it's a little bit challenging. So thanks for bear, bearing with me, but my guests have an amazing connection. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce and then bring up our very first guest. <clears throat> our first guest is Terry Brooks. Terry Brooks was born in Illinois in 1944, a writer since high school and, <clears throat> pardon me, and heavily influenced by William Faulkner. It took him seven years to finish writing The Sword of Shannara, which published in 1977. It became the first work of fiction to ever appear on the New York Times trade paperback bestseller list, where it remained for over five months. He published The Elf Stones of Shannara in 1982 and The Wish Song of Shannara in 1985, both bestsellers. I have to say, I discovered here at the Levac Public Library The Sword of Shannara when I was a child and it sparked my love of fantasy fiction. Now, since that time, Terry's written numerous novels in the Shannara, Landover, and World Void series, including included being hand-selected by George Lucas to write the novelization of Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, which hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. So, bringing him to the virtual stage, welcome, Terry. Hello there. Nice to be somewhere. Now, I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> Good to have you in my hometown library, Terry. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go hide backstage and let you take. I feel like I'm in uh, Hogwarts here as I look out at that backdrop of this library. It's incredible. I haven't been in anything that good in years. I've been in these smaller libraries uh, being a small town boy. Um, it would be nice to be back in Calgary. I miss it. I haven't been there for, gosh, I don't know now, at least 10 years. Um, and I was going regularly in the 90s and then, and then in the early 2000s. So uh, now I don't get to go much of anywhere. Uh, and hopefully that will change. But you probably all wish the same thing at this point. So I'm supposed to read to you and I am going to uh, do that. Uh, I have finished the Shannara series for the immediate future at least. And I'm now writing in Child of Light. Uh, Child of Light is... Uh, a book that published last year. It's the first in a set of books that I intend to do. Uh, and I'm going to read from the second book, which just by coincidence happens to come out this October. Uh, not doing any publicity or anything, but I thought it'd be fun to read from it and see if it holds up to any kind of standard that's uh, acceptable. So um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, I'm speaking up, uh, I hope, as loud as I can uh, so that you can pick out the differences between the words I mean to say and the words that I don't mean to say. So at this point, uh, let me read to you from uh, what I've written. I'm going to read three or four pages of this. Uh, I'm not going to take time to explain what's going on. You will figure it out quick enough. Uh, and it's self-explanatory, and it ends at the point that the chapter ends as well. So that will help. So without 
further ado. When she sees the giant, she skids to a stop at once, the cudgel lowering as she realizes what confronts us. Then, you get away, she shouts, raising the cudgel once more, demonstrating her determination to take action. Go on, get away right now. Shar, Harrow says in his calm, measured way, go back inside, please. Let us handle this. The giant seems content to let that happen. It has barely glanced at Shar since she emerged uh, and doesn't bother to do so now as she slowly backs away toward the house. I glance again at the other houses for some indication of help, but find nothing. It seems that Harrow and I will need to manage this threat alone, if there even is a threat. Thus far, the giant hasn't approached us. It just seems content to block our path. I take a moment to consider why. The elevated tree lane continues to wind through the old growth toward the west end of the city, past a scattering of houses that sit mostly to one side, one of which is Ancros, into which Shar has just disappeared. Suddenly, I realize what is happening. Shar, I scream and rush forward. Harrow is a step behind me, and it is he that the giant continues to evaluate, ignoring me completely. My inish is already gathered, so I send every bit of power I can summon hammering into this giant, but the creature barely reacts, as if my strike were no more than a bothersome breeze. I scream at Harrow to run, to find help, but he ignores me and advances on the giant. When the two collide, the sound is audible. Harrow gives his best, but the giant is too much for him, breaking his grip and shoving him aside. When it comes for me, then it comes for me. For something is huge, it is amazingly quick. It is on me before I can reach Harrow's house, its huge arms drawing me into its grasp. But Rondon's lessons on overpowering a stronger foe have stayed with me, and I use my inish to spray the planking in a wide slick that takes the giant's feet out from under it the moment it touches me. It topples and skids away in a thrashing heap, though it does not follow the first goblins off the tree lane. Still, this gives me enough time to reach Harrow's house and rush inside. Rondon lies unconscious in the hallway and Raimi pounds on the closet door from inside. Goblins have hold of Shar and are hauling her toward the doorway in which I stand. I am determined to stop them when huge hands grab me from behind and lift me right off the floor. The giant has me and the goblins rush past us with Shar in their grip. I see the fear in her eyes. Then all three are out the door and gone. I try to use my inish to break free, but the giant has been paying attention. One hand holds both of mine locked together while the other covers my mouth. It looks into my eyes, studying me. No, not studying me, identifying me. This creature knows who I am. I stare back. Who are you? I snap. But the giant simply sets me aside, almost gently, and goes out the door after the goblins swiftly disappearing over the side of the tree lane. I scramble up and rush after it, almost colliding with Harrow as he arrives at the door. Without speaking, he points to where the giant leapt off the pathway, and we charge over to look down. We catch just a glimpse of it disappearing into the darkness, accelerating so quickly it is gone almost instantly. Shar, I scream, starting in the direction I think the goblins have taken. Harrow starts to follow, but I shout over my shoulder, no, no, go back. Rhonda needs you. Don't worry about me. He hesitates, but then turns around and I tear down the nearest stairs after Shar's captors. The giant must have been with them. There is no other explanation for its behavior. It will follow them, so I must go after it. I do this without stopping to consider what I am risking. How can I not? This is Shar we are talking about. Shar, for whom I would do anything. Once at ground level, I return into the darkness where the giant disappeared. It is so quick, I am not sure I can catch it. But if it is with the goblins, it will have to slow down. Goblins are strong, but slow moving. What will I do once I catch them remains to be seen, but I will have to come up with something, especially if the giant is with them. As I run, I remember how the creature looked at me as if it knew me. But I have never encountered anything like it or at least not that I recall, which might be the crux of the issue. Though I have learned a lot about myself in the past two years, I still don't recall more than fragments of my past before I entered the goblin prisons. 
Still, it doesn't look to be fae, and it certainly is not human. I can think of no one and nothing I have encountered that might fit this description. Yet it seems to know me. It doesn't make sense. I push on through the network of buildings and shops that is viridian deep, further into darkness until no artificial lights are visible, and the only illumination that guides me comes from the moon and stars, now revealed as the cloud lift, lift cover lifts. I have not yet caught sight of those I track, but my instincts, which I have come to trust implicitly, tell me they are not far ahead. I skirt a series of small ponds and head toward a broad stretch of heavily wooded hills. There are goblin settlements north of here where the Sylvan territory ends, but all of them are miles off, and I doubt that Char's kidnappers intend to travel all night. More likely, they will stop to rest a little further on, perhaps no more than another few miles. It grows more isolated and lonelier. I find myself wishing Harrow had accompanied me after all, but I couldn't let him leave an unconscious Rondon behind because Ramy is locked in the closet. I re <clears throat> reflect briefly on my family and how close we have all become. We are kindred spirits from the start. Even before we knew we were related by blood or adoption, Rondon and I are, and our half sisters are our only blood children of Ancro, while the younger girls are adopted, and Harrow too, though he wouldn't allow, and though he didn't know it until he arrived in the, my world in an upside down situation. But even in the midst of this chaos, Harrow was my rock, and the girls were my champions. When Ancro died, we bonded even more tightly. Rondon moved house to stay with Rami and Char while Harrow and I, now partnered, remained in the cottage down the lane. But still, there was one thing that kept me separated from them, and that was my physical appearance, for I looked completely human, or I did, until right after Harrow and I pledged at Promise Falls. Then my hair, sleek and dark, began to take on a greenish tint. Little leaves blossomed among the strands, and my feeling of alienation lessened. Since then, I have begun to assume further sylvan characteristics. Now my skin is changing from human olive to sylvan pine. My hair has begun to sprout more of those soft, tiny leaves that always make me want to run my fingers through Harrow's locks. And the undersides of my arms and the insides of my legs have exhibited a steady growth of short fringe from shoulders to wrists and thighs to feet. I am not entirely altered. Further change will take more time. Or maybe I am already as sylvan as my body will allow, whether that be from my half-human heritage or because of whatever my adoptive father's medicines might have messed with as his efforts to keep me looking human and safe in the world of the hostile right fae. One thing I tell myself, I will know. One day, I will know everything. I have reached the boundary of the city and I pause to see if there is any indication of where to go next, but I have lost the trail. I stand rooted in place as the darkness looms ahead, trying to figure out what to do next. I should go back. I should find Harrow and return in daylight to track the goblins and the giant when I can see evidence of their passing. But I dislike the idea of giving up. Just a little farther, I think. Shar is depending on me. I will walk another mile and then turn back and, and begin again when the night fades. I set out once more, searching out anything that will confirm I'm on the right track. I work my way deeper into the trees, catching a glimpse of an owl as it flies past and listening to the sounds of the night birds hunting. But I can see no traces of the goblin trail. Either I missed a sign or I have misinterpreted what my instincts told me earlier. I have to give up for tonight. I have to turn back. Yeah, when I attempt to do so, I find myself face to face with the giant. It blocks my way like a wall, staring down at me. My heart is in my throat. How did it manage to get so close to me without my knowing? I consider running, but no, I won't make it past the first two steps. As I hesitate, the giant picks me up like a toy and holds me in front of its concealed face. Again, I am being studied, examined in a way that suggests familiarity. Its head cocks one way and then it cocks the other. 
and it moves me close to its faceplate. I cannot see inside, but I can feel its eyes on me. A deep rumbling rises up from within. Oris, I stare in shock. It does recognize me. It knows me. Oris, it asks again. And suddenly, I know that voice. Something about it, something is familiar. It can't be, but it is. So I'm not going to tell you anymore. That's it. I will tell you that uh, this book comes out in October and is the first in, the, in my new series I'm writing. So that's what I have to say. Awesome. That was fantastic, Terry. Thank you so much. I want to remind uh, viewers that you can request Terry's book at your local bookstore, at your local library, and as well, um, our chair of When Words Collide, Randy McCharles, actually sent some handy links that I can share here. And of course, you can find them over at big retailers like Amazon and other places. So, Terry, thank you so much. That was awesome. I am going to um, I'm going to let you get comfortable in our virtual green room while I bring up our next guest. And our next guest coming up, I have to find the banner here, is Susanna. Susanna Kearsley, New York Times, USA Today, and Globe and Mail best-selling author, is a former museum curator who loves restoring the lost voices of real people to the page, often in twin-stranded stories that interweave present and past. Her award-winning novels are published in translation in more than 25 countries, and she lives near Toronto. Welcome to the virtual stage, Susanna Kearsley. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hey, Mark. I can't see you because you're just a black rectangle right now, but... Uh... <laughs> rectangle. I'm going to go higher and see if I can. Oh, okay. It's really, really wonderful to be here. Um, like Terry, I, I kind of wish I was in person in, in Calgary, but I'm just so thrilled to be a part of this right now. Um, and, and just so thrilled that everybody that has come out to, uh, to join us this evening. Um, this is wonderful. Um, I'm going to read from something new too, except I'm a much slower writer than most people. So um, the book I'm reading from is my work in progress, which I have to turn into my editors next summer. Uh, so it won't be on shelves until 2024. Um, it is a dual time novel like most of my books, but uh, it is dual time all in the past, which is something that my brain has just started doing lately. So I'm this is all new for me too, um, but it does still have, uh, this one has a little element of uh, paranormal woven into it um, because the male uh, lead, I'm working also with two first person narrators, which I've never really done before, a man and a woman. Um, and the, the man is actually an ancestor of uh, one of my uh, other, heroes that has been in a couple of my books, Robbie McMorrin, um, who has the site. So this is, again, something kind of new for me. Um, but I'm just going to kind of dive into it again. You'll you'll kind of get a feel for, like, uh, as with Terry's, you'll kind of get a feel for what's going on. I will tell you that it is set in 1613, a um, little bit earlier time period. Uh, but I never know where my characters are going to put themselves until they they turn up on the page. I'm not a really good plotter. I'm one of those annoying pantser people. So my characters just give me a first sentence and I throw them on the page and run with it and we see what happens. So here you go. It's called The Lesser Stars. I do know the title, which is usually helpful. Um, but uh, I'm going to read you uh, starting with the female uh, narrator. I'm not going to read you all of her bit. I'm going to kind of truncate it a bit and then we're going to go to the male narrator's introduction and then I'll see how far I get in my 20 allotted minutes. 
we'll see how we go. Okay, so this is Phoebe. He is the most infuriating man. I spoke those words to no one but myself as I was entering the kitchen. Yet my father and his elder sister, my Aunt Agnes, heard me notwithstanding and immediately knew which man I meant. My father, fitting on his doublet, asked, What has he done to sour thy mood this morning with the sun so newly up? The truth was, Andrew Logan had to do no more than stand within my sight to sour my mood. He'd been our neighbor ten years since the death of Queen Elizabeth had passed her crown to Scotland's King James, binding both the courts in one and bringing Logan's family south to London in his service. And in all that time, I could not think of once my path had crossed with Logan's when he hadn't left me irritated, nor when I'd been granted the last word. It was that final point in truth that had me most annoyed this morning because having put the distance of the courtyard between myself and Logan now, my mind could rapidly frame several sharp replies to his last comment, any one of which would have done better than the gaping silence in which I'd watched the big Scotsman's back retreating from my view. I had been unprepared. I did not often see him at the conduit. Most days one of his sisters fetched the water. And hearing the old gardener who came there every morning fawn and laugh and praise him for his drunken misdeeds of the night before had made my temper flame. I gave my father now the details of that violent behavior as I'd gleaned them from the gardener's talk, then eased the hard yoke from my shoulders, set my pails upon the floor and said, I merely asked him if by daylight he did not feel shame for his attack upon a better man. My father's eyebrows lifted. And what did young Logan say to that? That he would feel no shame for having done what needed doing. And if I stood in defense of Valentine, I had his pity. His contempt, he might have said, for it showed plainly in his eyes while he was speaking. And for one weak moment, I had been confused enough to want to ask him why. But then he'd wheeled away abruptly, and I turned my own back too. And we had neither of us wasted any further breath in argument. And Agnes disliked conflict. She brushed the subject away with a move of her hand as she might wave aside rising smoke from the fire at the hearth where she sat with the linens and hose she was patient, patiently mending. "'Tis but words,' she reminded me. "'Valentine Fox can defend himself.' "'I know he can,' I said, and trusted my voice sounded confident. Privately, I was less sure. I'd seen Valentine give a display of his swordsmanship, and with his height and lean form, he would make an impressive opponent." But Andrew Logan was built like a great brainless ox, and in a fight with fists, as it apparently had been last night, the odds fell in his favor. It was plain he had my father's favor also. No doubt Valentine provoked him. I thought it hardly likely. Pray, when has Andrew Logan needed provocation to begin a fight? When it would make an enemy of someone who could see him lose his place at court, that's when, my father said. Only a very great insult indeed could have made him take such a risk. I raised one shoulder in a half shrug. I'm sure Valentine told him no more than the truth. In his place, I'd have thought of a great many things to tell Logan, that he was a bully for one and uncultured and you think too harshly at the lad, Aunt Agnes said in her mild tone that held the firmer edge designed to shape my manners into something more polite. I said nothing though I might have pointed out that Andrew Logan was a lad no longer. The sullen 16-year-old who had come here from Scotland was a grown man now, with two more years beneath his belt than my own 24, and at the conduit he had fair towered above me, or so it had seemed. I'd been forced to look up all the daggers of my own gaze being deflected by his stubborn chin. Plainly my aunt and father had not faced that side of Logan yet, else I would have more of their sympathy. My father, for his part, was fully focused now on dressing in a way that I had not seen him do in some days, and that fact diverted me from my small inconveniences and minor squabbles. As he fitted on his hat, the one with the fine feather and the polished gilded clip shaped like a rose, I said, You are called to the palace. I am. Then the king has returned. He has. My aunt said, But the Princess Elizabeth has not yet sailed. You would think her own father might wish to stay by her till her ship leaves, so she's given a proper farewell. With one glance, my father reminded his sister the king was not someone to criticize. Returning his attention to the angle of his hat brim, my father asked, what would he gain by standing on the shore and weeping while her ship sails off? It would not make their parting any easier. 
The king owes no one any such display of his emotions, for it is in truth a private pain to lose the ones we love. Aunt Agnes had no argument to offer, knowing well my father knew that pain himself and deeply, as did I. The king had also suffered loss. Of his seven children, only three survived their infancy, and one of those had fallen this past winter. Handsome Prince Henry, the Prince of Wales, pride of our nation, struck down by an illness so sudden the gossip still crouched in their corners and whispered strange theories. So yes, the king might be forgiven for turning his face from another loss. Except, the princess has not died, I told them. She has only married. My aunt said idly she saw a little difference between death and marriage. I've observed some women wish for death the longer they are married. She was teasing, but it drew another sidelong look of warning from my father. Agnes, he rebuked her, do not fill my daughter's head with nonsense. She will marry a fine man of a good family who will give her healthy children and a life of ease at court. I spoke those words with him in unison, an easy thing to do when I had heard them said so frequently. I felt the faint roll of my eyes and knew my father noticed. Disbelieve if you will, he told me, but our lives are guided by the planets and their motions. We cannot escape their destiny. I did not share my father's faith in almanacs and stars, nor in the doctor of astrology who'd cast a figure at the hour of my birth and made that bold prediction. But I hope. And then we're going to skip ahead to Andrew. This is Andrew's entrance. Be grateful you were born a man, my younger sister said to me. She was the dreaming sort and not inclined to notice things that did not touch on her directly. And admittedly, I had arranged my hat to hide the worst part of the bruising round my eye from last night's brawl. But I could not keep from smiling at her comment, which was all at once divided from the truth of life as I had lived it and yet still exactly what I needed most to hear this morning to restore my humor. Looking down at her, I asked, and why is that? I had to put my arm out as I spoke to draw her back a moment while a cart horse lumbered by, its great hooves landing in the very place her smaller feet had lately been. My own horse, Brutus, tossed his head against the reins held in my other hand, indignant he was being led instead of ridden. But since he had cast a shoe a few streets back, I had no choice but to endure his silent wrath and lead him walking, for to bear the weight of both of us would have done his hoof damage. With a lethal glare at me, he fell in step as we walked on. My sister hadn't noticed as her whole attention was still focused on explaining why I was so fortunate to be a man. Because, she said, if you didn't have a mind to marry, you could do it as you pleased. Well, I must wait till Jeannie weds before I can be matched myself. And she and Roger have been waiting so long for the Queen's approval that I fear it never will be given and I'll die a maid. I was about to reassure her that she had no need to worry, that the Queen in her own time would give her blessing to our other sister's marriage. But it struck me that she seemed over-interested. And glancing down more piercingly, I asked, who is it you would haste to marry? I am not one of your criminals. You needn't turn inquisitor. There is no man. And even if there was a man, which there is not, it would not be your business. Meaning that there definitely was a man then. Her deep sigh confirmed it. But, she said, tis an outdated rule that the younger must wait till the elder is wed. Aye, well, I wish to be in the room when you tell Minnie she's outdated. That earned a brief smile from her as she imagined our mother's reaction. Well, I'd not used that word with her, she said, but if this goes on for much longer, I will speak my mind. I'll be 18 soon, Andrew, and Jeannie, she added, her tone pitched to sound like a warning, is 22. Ancient, I said, four years younger than me, and I felt every day of my age as my shoulder protested the sharp movement I made to hold back my sister a second time out of the way of disaster. If you don't mind how you go, you'll have no need to worry over weddings. I might as well have told a skylark not to sing. My younger sister was a lively lass, and as we came through together into the stable yard at the Queen's Palace of Somerset House, she was still oblivious to everything around us and still brightly talking. My height and size rarely allowed me to pass through a place without notice, still less when I was with Brutus, for he was a giant himself. But even if we had been stealthy as shadows, there was no hope of moving discreetly when I had my sister beside me. Her laughter and chatter rang out in that cobbled enclosed space so musically that all the heads of the horses came over their stalls as if they too would listen. 
My friend Owen Gilroy at work on a saddle glanced over and nodded at me and then flashed a smile full of charm. Good morrow, Margaret. She blushed and returned in the greeting and rising on tiptoe, she kissed me and thanked me and wished me a good day and scurried along to her work in the kitchens before I could make a reply. But as I turned back to Owen, I felt my eyes narrowing. Good morrow, Margaret. What is that exactly? He grinned. Nothing you need be concerned about. I had my next question framed in my mind, but it faded to nothing, together with everything else at the edge of my vision. As I looked at Owen, the cut of his clothes changed, and now at his right side stood Margaret, her hair in a style I had not seen her wear for, her eyes bright with pride. In her arms, she was holding a bear newly born. We'll be naming him Donald, she told me, our father's name. And then as swiftly as they had appeared, Margaret and the Baron vanished again, leaving Owen alone in the stables as they'd been afore. He'd stopped what he was doing with the saddle and was watching me. What? I ignored him, not from rudeness, but because it was the simplest way to manage things. I'd learned this lesson young, when I had learned not everybody had this gift or curse of second sight that gave unwanted glimpses of the things that were to come. My mother, a MacDougall from the Western Isles, had bid me hide it well, for while the sight might have been commonplace among her people, in Edinburgh and here it was a danger to possess, viewed as the devil's work and witchcraft. But Owen persisted. Are you feeling well? I knew the change was slight, slight when I was seeing. A loss of focus in my gaze, a blankness of expression brief enough to make most think I was distracted. Nothing more. But that distraction had been great enough this time for me to miss the entrance of the man who was now standing close beside me. Roger Peters was a fixture in these stables, being one of the Queen's favourite grooms. A man of my own age, he had a quick laugh and a quicker wit. And since I'd come to London, he and Owen had become my closest friends. With Roger waiting for the Queen's consent to wed my sister Jeanie, it appeared both men were destined to become my brothers also. But this morning, Roger's first thought was for Brutus. He has cast a shoe. Aye, I noticed as we came across, across Fleet Bridge. You did not ride him after that, I hope. You take me for a fool. The white of Roger's grin flashed suddenly across his darker skin as he tipped up my hat brim. I had best reserve my judgment till you tell me who did give you those. He'd seen my bruises. I hedged and did not answer him directly. I was in the star last night and helped a lad who needed helping, that is all. He was young and in his cups and seeking to defend a lass, he rashly found himself outnumbered in a fight. I took his part to make the odds more even. Owen from his corner said, a noble cause I'll grant you, but he knew me far too well. And with his keen eyes on my face, he asked, who was on the other side? I shrugged, three men whose names I could not tell you. Owen waited and? He would not leave it in a, alone, I knew, so I relented. And Valentine Fox. They both made the same noise, turned away from me briefly, and Roger said, you are a fool. And that's where we end. Awesome. You guys can't hear the clapping of the live audience here, nor the clapping <laughs> of the people in the digital world who are watching this. <laughs> Thanks so much, Susanna. You're welcome. I do want to remind people, ask for Susanna's books You're at welcome. your favorite local bookstore. You can ask for them at your uh, local public library as well. And of course, you can also find her books on all major retailers, including uh, the uh, world's longest river here. There's a link to it. <laughs> So thanks again, Susanna. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you join Terry back in the green room where you can enjoy all the wonderful refreshments we have there for you. And I am now gonna bring up our uh, third and final guest uh, of the readings, and then actually, of course, after we finish with Edward's reading, we're gonna bring everyone back on stage for live questions. Edward Willett. Freelance writer and performer Willett is the award-winning author of more than 60 books of science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction for readers of all ages. He's written 12 novels, five science fiction novels under his own name, three novels in the fantasy science fiction series World Shapers. He's also written as Lee Arthur Chain, the 
epic steampunk fantasy novels, and as E.C. Blake, the author of the Masks of Agira trilogy. Now, the book Mar Segura won the 2009 Aurora Award, honoring Canadian science fiction and fantasy for best long-form work in English, and Edward's novel Terra in Segura was a finalist for the same award the following year. So, without further ado, let's bring to the stage Edward Willett. Thanks, Mark. I just realized my lighting here makes me look slightly and, uh, spooky. I'm going to go be a black <laughs> box. I just realized my... There you go. Well, um, you do. Are you going to read a scary story tonight? Uh, no, I'm not. This this is a science fiction novel. That's just the lighting is coming off the screen, and there's nothing in this corner, so I, I look a little a little creepy. But you could think of it as the light from a starship control panel. That would probably work for this story. I'm going to read a little bit from The Tangled Stars. This is my novel coming up from Daw, my 12th novel for Daw. Uh, you said 12 novels. That's just the Daw side. There's a whole bunch from some other publishers. Um, uh, and it's coming out in October, just like Terry's uh, novel. So there you go. October 18th, to be precise. I'm going to read two chapters. It doesn't take a lot of setup. The only thing you need to know is that uh, um, Cooper Douglas, who's the main character, and he's a first-person narrator we'll meet in the second chapter of this reading, but he's sort of the main uh, narrator, is kind of a scavenger, a little under the law kind of guy. And he has just discovered that, think of it as a wormhole network that used to exist but collapsed uh, ca catastrophically many years ago seems to have reopened and he's got plans to go through it to escape some bad debts he has in the solar system and maybe make a fortune in a new world but to do that he needs to contact an old flame of his called Lisa Gray. Lisa is now a cop on the moon and so we start with uh, the first chapter is from Lisa's point of view. Uh, third person narrator, the second chapter is Coop Douglas, uh, first person narrator and there's also a very important character named Tybalt. Tybalt is a cat a genetically modified cat with an AI overlay that makes him super intelligent, but he's still a cat. And every chapter in the Tangled Stars starts with a little bit of a Tybalt's wisdom, his private log. So that's how this starts. Tybalt's private log. I don't entirely understand the binding force of laws. If Coop yells at me for, say, scratching something he would prefer unscratched, I, of course, desist. But if he is not there to yell at me, I scratch away. Yet some humans obey laws even when there isn't an immediate threat of punishment, a conundrum. Message from Cooper Douglas, said a voice in Lisa Gray's ear, and she almost died. Not from the emotional shock and or thrill of hearing from Coop for the first time in years, but because at that precise moment she was engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a drugged-up gunrunner in the abandoned lava tubes north of Apollo City. Fortunately, whatever substances the gun runner, who stood a head taller than her and outmassed her by probably 50 kilos, had smoked, injected, and or imbibed, had had the effect of slowing his reflexes rather than heightening them, and he missed the opportunity to punch her in the face, or rather saw it, and went for it much too slowly so that her mistake suddenly turned into a brilliant feint. He went down for the count a moment later. Breathing hard and sweating in her depressurized surface suit, there was air in them there tunnels, though exactly who had broken every regulation on the books and bribed who knew how many life support engineers and inspectors to make that happen, she didn't know. She pulled the dazed gun runner's thick wrists behind his back, immobilized them with magnetic restrainers, and propped him up against the wall, ready for pickup by the cleanup crew that was already en route. Then she went in search of her partner, Derek Bronson, who had disappeared through the open pressure door on the far side of the rough-hewn, unfurnished chamber, moments before the now quiescent thug had made his bellowing appearance through that same door. She found him flat on his back. For a moment, she feared the worst, but before she could kneel to check on him, he groaned and sat up. Something hit me, he said by way of explanation, looking up at her through eyes she could tell weren't focusing very well. Something hit me too, she told him, but I hit back. She jerked a thumb at the door. He's laid out in there. Every room should have an unconscious male stretched out in it, I've always said. Ha ha, Bronson said, then winced and rubbed the back of his head. Then he blinked too slow, three fast, and his eyes went even more unfocused. Lisa knew he was checking the medical readout projected onto his right retina by the nanotech monitoring his biosigns. Slight concussion, he read out loud. Mandatory 48-hour suspension from duties, effective immediately. Lisa shrugged. Shift's over anyway. We got the guy. She took a really good look around the room then for the first time and whistled. And the goods. Bronson nodded. Yep, he said. The tip was good. The tip was gold. 
Long crates lined the far side of the chamber, each bearing the same symbol, a three-cornered shield emblazoned with a stylized globe of earth, the word Earth Force stenciled below it. Each, Lisa knew from what the tipster had told her, contained 24 military-grade multi-rifles capable of firing lasers, bullets, and chemballs, and launching an impressive variety of grenades, from simple flashbangs to stun gas to high explosives to the charming, flesh-shredding shrappers. Someone had smuggled these military weapons to the moon, and Lisa knew why, to help arm the people of the new moon, whose goal was the liberation of Luna from Earth control. Weapons like this would bring that day one step closer. Or maybe not so gold, Lisa continued. My source said the tunnels were in vacuum and the goods unguarded, but I'm not wearing a helmet and there was very much a guard. I noticed, Bronson said, gingerly touching his head. The ranger's countertech had provided sufficient to disable the various sensors and cameras Lisa had been warned about. Fortunately, Lisa had proved sufficient to disable the big thug she hadn't been warned about. I'll have to have a word with my source, she thought. Noises in the outer room coincided with a message in her own right eye telling her the cleanup crew was on site. She went to the door. Need a medic in here too, she said, the two crouched by the thug she'd floored. One of them brushed by her to take a look at Bronson, and Lisa went over to the leader of the five-person crew, a short, muscular woman with black skin and graying hair. Lieutenant Kipris, Lisa said by way of greeting. Adeche Kipris looked at her. Ranger Gray. Lisa glanced at the guy on the floor. Unexpected? The lieutenant shrugged. You expect the unexpected in this business. Like the message from Coop that almost got me killed, Lisa thought, but didn't say. Adeche Kipris knew who Cooper Douglas was. Lisa didn't want the lieutenant knowing he'd suddenly gotten in touch with her for reasons she couldn't even imagine. She particularly didn't want the lieutenant knowing he'd gotten in touch with her via the secret secure link they'd set up back in her pre-ranger days when they'd worked and done other things together, the kind of link she really, really wasn't supposed to have. The unexpected is a sign of bad intel, Lisa said instead. I had reason to believe my intel would be exceptionally good this time. Kipris looked away. Feeling a little guilty, Lisa wondered? It seemed unlikely. She'd never much noticed the lieutenant having any kind of feelings. No such thing as perfect intel, Kipper said, watching as Bronson emerged from the other room on the arm of the medic. Anyway, no harm done. Tell that to Bronson. Kipper shrugged and glanced back at her. The goods are in the other room? Yes, at least that part of the intel was accurate. They're ready for confiscation. The lieutenant flicked a hand toward the outer tunnel. Got the sleds out there. It will all get where it's supposed to go. Good to hear, Lisa said. I'm out of here. Shift's over. Of course, Kipper said. Good work, Ranger Gray. Thank you, Lieutenant, Lisa said absently, her mind already returning to the message from Coop. Something must have shown on her face because the lieutenant raised an eyebrow. Anything else? Lisa's attention suddenly refocused on where she was and who she was with. No, she said, very casually, very much not as if she were trying to cover for the anything else that there definitely was. Talking to Lieutenant Kipris was always like picking her way through a minefield, which Lisa had done during a surface raid on a drug lab dome, so she knew exactly how dangerous it was. Just trying to decide where to go for dinner. Elementals, Kipris said without a moment's hesitation. They've been growing meat in those vats for a century. Best steaks on Luna. Go for the filet mignon. Good idea, Lisa said, and it did sound good, but she had other plans. She left the lieutenant, patted Bronson on the shoulder, and told him he'd be fine, he should get some rest, and she'd manage a couple of days without him, and then went out into the lava tube, past the cargo sleds that would carry the confiscated Earth weapons to their new ultra-secure location deep inside Lunar Ranger headquarters, where someday they'd be ready to hand if the people of the New Moon decided its peaceful efforts at subversion and manipulation had pale failed, and it was time to launch a violent revolution. The new moon cell that secretly controlled Ranger's headquarters, and to which both Kipris and Lisa belonged, would see to that. Lisa was sorry Bronson had been hurt, but on the other hand, the fact someone had been waiting for them, and he had been hurt, would make it hard for anyone to be suspicious about the provenance of this load of weapons. Then her eyes widened, and she stopped in her tracks. That bitch! Adeche Kipris had set them up. She must have. She'd made sure there was an unexpected guard, but she'd also made sure he was a druggie with a plentiful supply and that he'd be unarmed. He'd offered only token resistance, but he had offered resistance, and that would go on the report and help ensure no awkward questions were raised that someone at Internal Affairs might decide to investigate. The new Mooners very much wanted to infiltrate and subvert Internal Affairs, but they hadn't managed it yet, so they were always a threat. Lisa resumed walking. You almost have to admire her, she thought. Almost. 
Half an hour later, Lisa sat on her couch in her apartment located in one of the sectors of Apollo City where a grav web provided Earth normal weight. Rangers were required to live in full grav sectors for physical fitness reasons, to ensure we're tough, mean law enforcement machines, as Bronson had once put it. Lisa figured Bronson would have laughed himself silly if he'd seen his tough, mean law enforcement machine of a partner wearing the very fluffy, very pink dressing gown she'd donned when she'd emerged from the shower, but she didn't care. It was warm and fuzzy, and she liked it. She pulled her bare feet up under herself and finally accepted Coop's message. His face was leaner and older than she remembered it, but he was still recognizably Coop, and a flood of memories accompanied his image, memories she'd mostly kept walled off since he'd left, since she'd made him leave. After she'd listened to what he had to say, she sat staring at the time-shifted abstract on the far side of the room. It currently featured moody brown and black concentric circles that far better suited her mood than the pink dressing gown. Damn it, Coop, what the hell are you playing at? Scapa Flow should still be about four hours out, and Coop had said he'd wait for ten hours once he landed. She blinked her eyes in the pattern that connected her to Ranger HQ and put herself down for a personal leave day. Nobody would question it with her partner on a two-day medical suspension. She'd just be sitting at her desk if she went in anyway, since they wouldn't pair her with anybody else unless he was off for a bit longer than 48 hours, a lot longer. She'd let Cooper Douglas stew for a few hours while she made up her mind what to do with him. For now, she decided she'd get dressed, take Lieutenant Kippers' advice, and head to Elementals for a steak supper. Tearing into a bloody hunk of meat with a sharp knife sounded like a great idea. She could imagine it was part of a certain ex's anatomy. Chapter 9. Tybalt's Private Log. I am a discerning cat who only warms up to certain carefully screened and vetted people who are worthy of my attention. Unless I'm offered a rump rub, then all bets are off. Lisa didn't call. She didn't call before we went into orbit. She didn't call before we got our landing window. She didn't call before we touched down. She didn't call while our deuterium tanks were filled, which took an alarming bite out of my already well-chewed bank account. As promised, I waited in the ship. The minutes and then the hours ticked by. And still, she didn't call. She knocked instead. Someone's in the docking tunnel, Ernie said. Ernie is the AI that runs the ship. Annunciator panel activated. Normally, you'd expect a voice, someone requesting access. Instead, I heard seven sharp raps in a very specific rhythm. Two short, one long, three short, one long. Another code we'd shared back when we were together. Outside view, Ernie, I said. The stubby cigar shape of the Ernest Cox, which is also the Scapa Flow, the ship that was mentioned earlier, it's under a pseudonym, rested in the forward two prongs of a standard landing cradle. A bigger ship would have used all three. The foremost prong was connected by a pressurized tunnel to the main spaceport building, and one of our two access hatches formed an airtight seal with it. The second access hatch connected to the second prong, which was not pressurized. In space stock, you used one hatch to access the station and the other for when you needed access to the outer hull. On Luna, the second hatch provided access to the lunar surface, should anyone need such a thing for repair or inspection. While the grav web was on or the ship was landed, the airlock deck was two decks below the main deck, with the deck in between devoted to various bits of equipment and generally inaccessible to the human crew, since Ernie had maintenance robots to fix anything that needed fixing, and it wasn't like I had the slightest idea what to do when something broke anyway. A portion of the main display lit up with a somewhat distorted wide-angle view of the interior of the landing cradle's forward prong. A figure stood there wearing the dark green uniform of a lunar ranger. Unfortunately, part of that uniform was a hard, skull-crowning helmet whose rim and half-visor half completely blocked my view of the person's face, although it did not block my view of the person's sidearm, a nasty little smart ammo beamer combo called a ranger special. The person knocking on the annunciator panel, knocked on the annunciator panel again and then looked up at the camera. It was indeed Lisa. I felt my face split in a grin and jumped up so fast I almost banged my head on the ceiling. Once I'd touched down, I shouted, Grant access, Ernie, then hurried to the ladder and down to the access deck, Tybalt leaping onto my shoulders as I descended, a furry, purring mantle. Clearly on the cat level, at least, he was looking forward to seeing Lisa, whatever the AI overlay might think. By the time I reached the airlock, it stood open, and Ernie had extended a ladder down inside the pylon and another that rose a couple of meters above the deck. I watched as Lisa, her back to me, climbed up and stepped from that ladder onto the deck. As she turned toward me, I said, Lisa, thanks for... I didn't even register her swinging fist until I found myself on the floor with my chin hurting, the side of my face flaming, my ears ringing, and Tybalt, cat instincts triggered, hissing back arched in the corner where I leaped as I fell. Why the hell did you come back, Lisa said, standing over me. Despite her words, she didn't sound angry so much as tired. She pulled the ranger special from its holster and pointed it at my head. You're under arrest, 
She glanced at the cat. Not you, Tybalt. Good to see you, by the way. Tybalt gave her a curt nod, one of the few human gestures he's adopted, then set to furiously flattening his fur with his tongue. Being placed under arrest was not unexpected, given the circumstances, though I admit the blow to the head had taken me by surprise. Fine, I said. Also, ow. I moved my jaw back and forth. It didn't seem to be broken. Lisa must have pulled her punch. Fine, put me under arrest. But let me make a brief statement before you haul me away. Lisa's eyes narrowed. She looked the same as I remembered her, give or take a few lines. As I've mentioned, she stood as tall as me, and I wouldn't have wanted to tangle with her in a fight, much as I love to tangle with her in other ways, because she lived in full grab and worked out religiously, and I didn't. I couldn't see hair beneath her helmet, but since none of it was hanging out, I figured she must have cropped it a lot shorter than she used to wear it. There was a time it hung almost to the small of her back. I wondered what color it was now. Probably her natural black, since her skin and eyes were their default shades of brown. Answer me, Coop, she said. Why did you come back? That, I replied, is precisely what my brief statement will address. She pressed her lips together, but stepped back to allow me to get up, although she kept her weapon pointed at me. Then talk. But don't think for a second that it's going to make a damn bit of difference. Can we at least go into the galley, I said, once I'd regained my feet? It's a bit early locally for beer, and I don't suppose you'd drink one on duty anyway, but I've got a small stash of actual earth-grown coffee. Pre-salvaged, Lisa said. And although she didn't indicate air quotes with her fingers, they were definitely in her voice. Purchased, I said with great dignity, quite legally. And was the money to make that purchase also obtained quite legally? I choose not to answer that, I said. Lisa still has that law allowing anyone arrested to stay silent so as not to incriminate themselves, doesn't it? You just answered the question. I did not. I indicated the ladder up to the main deck. Shall we go up? You first. I'll go first, Tybalt said. Growled, really. He scurried up the ladder, not as gracefully as he generally liked to appear, although with far less flailing than a real cat would have displayed, but rapidly. I climbed up the ladder with very little grace myself, Lisa following just the right distance behind to keep me covered without giving me an opportunity to, say, kick her in the face. Not that I would have, but I could tell that's what she was doing. Well, she has been at this cop thing for more than 10 years now, I thought. I guess it's ingrained. I frowned as I walked ahead of her into the galley to make the coffee. Not too ingrained, I hope. The coffee maker was a sleek silver device bolted to the countertop between the refrigerator and the food printer. I switched the maker to its Luna Gravity setting. It also had settings for Mars and Earth, plus zero G. Carefully measured out the coffee beans, ground them, and set them to brewing. The coffee maker wasn't part of the original equipment of the galley because almost nobody could afford coffee in the outer system. I really had bought mine legally, though, from a luxury vendor on a pleasure gambling palace called the Maroon of Vesta. Yes, its hull was a deep purple color. During one of those brief periods of time, I was flushed with cash, as opposed to the times of longer duration when I found I had instead flushed my cash, spending my substance on riotous living, as the prodigal son was said to have done in Jesus' parable in the Bible. Man, I hadn't thought of that parable in years. A side effect of being back on the moon, I guess. The religious instruction of the Suffer the Little Children Orphanage was even closer to the surface than usual. I guess I'd paid more attention than I'd thought. Although the Ten Commandments hadn't really rubbed off on me, I had managed to keep the one about not murdering so far. You've got to draw the line somewhere. I glanced back to see what Lacey was up to and saw her sitting cross-legged on the floor, her ranger special at her side and tibbled in her lap, rubbing his cheek on her chin while she petted him. Lucky cat, I thought, then turned away. What can I say? I'd been in space a long time, and it wasn't like I had a girl waiting for me back on I.O. Station. And Lacey and I had had something special once. Mm -hmm. At least, I'd thought so. The fact my jaw still ached and my right eye still rang was perhaps an indication that Lisa, if she'd thought so too, was over it. Well, I'm not counting on her feelings toward me. It's the job itself that will pull her in. The coffee finished making. I knew Lisa took it black like me, so I filled two white thermal cups and carried them to the galley table. Lisa looked up, nodded, gently pushed Tybalt off her lap, picked up her weapon, and came to join me. Tybalt followed and jumped onto one of the four chairs at the shiny silver table as I sat in one and Lisa took another. She laid her weapon on the table close to her right hand. At least she didn't keep a grip on it, although she did use her left hand to drink the coffee, and I knew for a fact Lisa was not left-handed. She closed her eyes momentarily and appreciatively as she took her first sip. Mmm, she said. Then she opened her eyes again. I was struck by how beautiful they were. You could lose yourself in eyes like that. I had once. Stop that. Lisa set down the cup. All right, she said. Make your statement. I hesitated. Have you called this in? I mean, are they expecting you to bring me in? She sighed. I should have, but no, I didn't call it in before I came. Technically, I'm not on duty. I took the day off. 
Well, that was something, but still I had to ask, are they tracking you? Her right hand strayed to her weapon. Why? I suddenly realized how ominous that last question could have sounded and raised my hands placatingly. Nothing like that. It's just once you've heard what I have to say, that might be important. She took another sip of coffee. This time her stare over the edge of the mug was piercing and fierce and not nearly as inviting. She also didn't answer my question. Talk, Coop. She put the cup firmly back on the table. Why are you here after promising me you'd never come back? I took a deep breath. This is harder than I thought it would be. I thought the problem would be getting her to trust me. What I hadn't thought about was how hard it might be for me to trust her. She wasn't operating outside the law anymore. She was as incited as you could get. She was a cop. She really could haul me off to Lunar Ranger headquarters and have me transported to an Earthside prison, a death sentence or the next thing to it. And if she really had become completely loyal to the system, despite battling it for years before becoming a ranger, then what I next told her, she'd tell her superiors. If that happened, Earth would suddenly rediscover an interest in the outer system, a fleet of warships would be dispatched, and the newly opened masked Primus would be locked down tighter than the orbiting capital itself. Not that it would matter to me, see prison Earthside death sentence above. So I took a minute to think, even though it made Lace's eyes narrow even more dangerously. Nothing had changed. I needed to escape Galioto. That mean it meant I needed to escape the solar system. That had been impossible until Mast Primus reopened. Now it was possible, but only if I had a mast capable starship. There was one on Earth. I couldn't get to Earth and couldn't convince a starship AI to cooperate with me if I did. Lisa said she could convince any AI to do anything and that she could get to Earth. Therefore, I had to enlist her help. All right, Lisa, I began. About three weeks ago, I was chasing salvage out near where Mask Primus would be if it still existed. A few minutes later, I finished with, you once told me you could get to Earth. You said you could dance rings around Earth's best AIs. So that's why I'm here. I'm asking you to help me get to Earth, steal the system's only operational starship, and become the first people to leave the solar system in more than a century. Lisa stared at me for a minute, then she held out her cup. I'll have another, she said. I opened my mouth to say something, thought better of it, took her cup silently, and returned to the coffee maker. What do you think of all this, Tybalt? I heard her ask. Tybalt couldn't really shrug, but his voice sounded like he had. There's no question Mask Primus has reopened in some fashion, and there's no question that to traverse it, you need special technology that exists only in specialized ships. There is only one such ship that might be operational. Coop wants to traverse Mast Primus. I go where he goes. Ergo, I suppose him in this attempt to steal that ship, which means I support him in this effort to enlist your help, though I have warned him several times that it is likely a fool's errand. I turned around with fresh cups of coffee. See, Tybalt thinks it's a good idea. I did not say it was a good idea, Tybalt said. It's a crazy idea, Lisa said flatly. I silently held out her refilled cup. She took it. Sneaking onto Earth, breaking into a museum, stealing a ship, assuming it really is operational, somehow getting back into space, and then trying to get all the way out to the outer system and farther without being blown out of the sky? It's insane. I sat down, sipped my coffee, and waited, trying to appear calm. It wasn't easy because my heart was racing. I knew that tone of voice from Lisa. It wasn't the tone of voice she would have used if she were about to reject everything I'd said out of hand, point the gun at me again, and march me off to face justice, or whatever passed for it on Luna. It was the tone of voice she'd used when, almost as insane, she said, as breaking into a terrorist headquarters to liberate a smart, alecky, AI-uplifted cat. And then she smiled and rubbed Tybalt behind the ears, and I knew I had her. There you go. That's the Tangled Stars, two chapters thereof, coming October 18th from Daw Books, an ebook. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Edward. And again, reminder to take a look for the new book. Take a look for links to Edward's books over at edwardwillett.com. Uh, there always, should be two. Check with your favorite local bookstore. Make sure. There should be two T's on Willett. You've that? got my name spelled wrong. Two T's in, the, in your uh, name. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to fix that. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm going to have to fix that. We're going we're to blame my virtual assistant here. You can also find his books uh, on, so Edward Willett with two L's and two T's. Uh, ask for her, your, his books at the library. Now, my virtual assistant who misspells things is uh, just on their way to bring Terry and Susanna back into the stage area from the green room, bringing these guys up and um, opening this up to questions. But before I take questions from the uh, live audience here or the audience at home, uh, I have a question for each of you, and, and I'd like to start in the same alphabetical order that you read in. And one of the things I'm always curious about is how do you decide 
what specific reading, uh, what piece of reading you're going to do. Is it always from that forthcoming book? Or are there certain classics of yours? Because you, you've all written so many different books. Are there uh, certain situations where you pick particular readings? And I'll start with Terry, please. I always read from something not in print, almost exclusively. Uh, why do I do that? Um, publicity, I know. Show something new. I assume everybody's read the old stuff, so it doesn't really make much difference, I don't think. The trick is to read something that engages the audience in, in a way that makes them want to read whatever it is that uh, you know that that the book is uh, that the passage is taken from. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I can't say anything. We lost him. He's gone. Is he gone again? You think he's gone? Well, okay. you know the you know the question he's going to ask is that us. So you might as well answer. Well, for me. <laughs> I had, I had actually about three different readings I could have done. And, you know, I never know because I hate reading my own. I, I, I never sound like the voice of the characters in my head. I always, I don't know about you guys, but I always, I see the book develop like a film in my mind. And I always hear the voices of the characters. And when I'm trying to read it, I never sound like them. So I just, it, I don't like reading my own stuff as much. Um, so it's always difficult for me to pick a scene to, to read. And I had a few different things and I thought, well, I also have the stuff that I'm reading, that I'm writing, you know, which might be kind of nice for people to, to hear. It's something different. It's like, as Terry said, it's something people haven't read before. Um, I, you know, it's not gonna be on shelves for a while. So sometimes it's not really fair for, you know, people to, to get all excited about something that they're not gonna be able to buy for two years. Cause I'm, like I said, I write at the, the piece of the lake evaporating. I'm really slow, um, but, you know, it when it, when you guys both said you were reading something new, I thought, yep, yeah, I'll just throw the other ones, you know, back on the shelf and I'll read the new stuff because it then makes us makes us a match set. And you know, it just kind of seemed like the thing to do. Yeah, and I kind of uh, just it depends on the venue and what you know, because I, I also write YA stuff and I write adult stuff. So if I was reading to school, I would read something different. But for this, uh, this is the latest thing, and it, it is available for pre order at least, even though it's not out till October eighteenth. And I happen to really enjoy this one. I really like the cat. <laughs> He's my favorite character. So I wanted to do something with the cat in there. And at the, and then the other thing is trying to pick a segment that doesn't take so much setup that it's incomprehensible. Um, and yet that also gives a sense of what the story is about. And so this is actually chapter eight and nine, but it is the point at which the whole, the whole gang gets together and they start off on the heist, which is kind of a, a large portion of the, the book. So it's it, that all comes into play too and in trying to find the thing that will grab people's interest and give them some sense of what the overall book is going to be like yeah ed you know uh you do not sound at all like a cat <laughs> but then i do not sound like a 20 year old woman either but in deference to my cat character he doesn't speak with the cat vocal apparatus he has like a <laughs> speaker so he can sound like anything <laughs> <laughs> I, I did narrate a book. I did do my own audiobook but narration question, for a book with a teenage girl, and I didn't sound like her at all. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you do have you do have that voice as well because I know you've done acting as well, right, Ed? Yeah, I'm a I'm a stage actor. I'm a member of Canadian Can Actors Equity. So I've done a lot of of stage acting. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I'm just going to pop up a comment from uh, one of the live viewers. Uh, uh, Shannon says, what a great lineup this year. And I have to agree. Amazing reading. Some amazing authors people need to check out. Questions from the live audience here? Anyone want to come up and ask a question or shall I repeat it? You don't have to be seen. You can ask the question and I will repeat it. Okay. So when you're creating a world that's unfamiliar to us, Right. Um, how do you manage giving the details without overly giving the details? Like, do you okay. question how many times do I have to mention this? Um, it is a book, so people can go back and check that. But I just want to okay. know what your process is in, in creating 
creating this world and creating the facts without the labor Okay, I will. I will do the Reader's Digest version of that question, if that's okay. <laughs> um, essayist here. So the, uh, Martha asked the question: When you're writing a book that's set in in a world different than ours, and you've all written fantastical or, or things that are not necessarily our world, maybe far removed from our world in some way, when you're doing the world building, when you're setting up the worlds, how do you share? the essence of the world without hitting the reader over the head too blatantly? And how do you fulfill the nature of that world as the story goes on? I mean, what, what are your secrets for not info dumping and boring the reader, but keeping them engaged in that unique world? And uh, I'll let you guys jump in since I'll probably black out every once in a while. You can jump in and answer that. I think if you notice what both Edward and Terry did was they moved their characters through the world um, and the characters were interacting with things in the world in a way that you could see they, get, they didn't stop and say, you know, I am now looking over here and this is what I'm seeing. It was they, they just picked an item up and, and used it and interacted with it. And as you're moving through, you know, you're you're blinking and and using the device that that lets you check your health or or Terry's character is using a certain weapon and interacting with a certain you know creature and and that helps create the landscape around you in a way that the the reader can see it and it starts fleshing out in little bits and pieces so that you know before you know it you've you've patchworked this this world instead of stopping dead and saying I'm now going to stand still and you know tell you what I see in the round. It's kind of, I'm just going to move my character through it and, and pick up the, the things that my character is is using and seeing on a daily basis. And you're going to see through the character's eyes what they see every day. I think that's one way to do it. Um, but, you know, Edward, what do you, what do, you do? Well, having having said that, and yeah, that is, I think that's, that's kind of the key. It's not the world that the characters are moving in. It's just their world. So they're not going to stop and comment yeah. on everything, but just through their, their normal actions, they're going to be interacting with, you know, all these science fictional things in my in my particular world. Having said that, there is probably a segment or two I could have found which have, which would have totally been an info dump because there are places where I had to explain some things very complicated about the interstellar network and all of that. But even then, I try to break it up so that um, you know maybe a character's thinking about it because uh, something's happening, and you, you try to not do it all at once and try to drop in what you need at each moment and develop it uh, as it goes along. It is always a challenge in writing science fiction and fantastical worlds, it is one of the things that makes it uh, different from writing something that's set in the world that everybody knows, because you do have to sometimes explain what's different in some fashion and make it clear how it all works. I think that we, uh, as professional writers, all try to avoid the ubiquitous uh, info dump where uh, we take time out to explain something in depth because that's when people start to think about dinner or something else. Uh, and instead, uh, feather things throughout the book, which both Edward and Susanna talked about. The other thing I like to do is I like to establish early on some characteristic or physical attribute or disability or whatever in most of my characters, particularly the main characters, of course. But I want the reader to connect early with the characters so I don't have to go back and explain again something that's crucial about them. I want them, or I want them to be set up early on with some kind of difficulty that they're struggling with, particularly, uh, or some misconception about themselves. Because I think readers, for the most part, are looking for those sorts of difficulties uh, to identify what it is that the characters are trying to overcome. And in my world, at least, everybody's always trying to overcome something. It's not the kind of world where, and, and in the epic fantasies or fantasies or space operas or whatever it is that we're writing, uh, that's the heart of the story is what is it that we're trying to overcome? And when you're dealing, I mean, even when you're dealing with like historical worlds that are sort of like ours, but not 
you know, like there, there's enough similarity there that you think you know the landscape you're moving through, but then not, you know, <laughs> you know, like it, it's, uh, you know, it's like going to a, a European country where, where things are kind of like home, but not. Um, it's, you, you just have to show the, the edges. Like it, 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 you, you have to know all the details. Like you have to know all the ins and outs of your world. You have to know, you know, the, the consistent parts of your world, but you don't have to throw everything on the page. Um, I think the reader knows if you don't know, the reader knows if you, you know, if you're skirting around a big hole in your world that you don't know what, what happens there. Um, but you don't have to put it all on the page. Um, you know, there, there are many, many times I have people go into a room and have a whole conversation in the room and I don't tell you what's in that room. I don't decorate the room. I don't tell you what color the walls are or what the, you know, what's on the mantelpiece or anything. I just, because it, you don't need to know it's a conversation that's important. Um, you know, it's, you, you, you choose how, you know, how detailed you get into to each scene. And if you, if you, are seeing it and you and it's real for you i think a lot of the time it becomes real for the reader edward before you speak this is where i like to jump in and say that my friend and fellow writer elizabeth george when she talks about how she structures her books which i pay attention to because they are way way long and they're very complex she always says what goes into my books for my characters is 25% of what I know, and the rest of it doesn't go in. But if I do it right, the books give the illusion that I do. And if you ask me about this, I could answer that question, and I would know what the answer is. And there is that verisimilitude you try to accomplish uh, when you're creating your characters that doesn't require a whole lot of that involvement that might be required if you were doing it through you know a long dissertation or something other plus let me add that when you get to be my age you have to give all that up because it all goes away <laughs> so so go ahead <laughs> go ahead I, I wasn't going to add much except just thinking that in theatrical terms you don't put you put a an illusion of the world is the backdrop yeah. And it's enough so that it seems real to the audience, but it's not really all there. It just feels like it's all there. So and that's the trick. <laughs> when Burbage played, the stage was bare. You know, you get, yeah. it's like you you make the audience see what you want them to see, and you you know sometimes you just need that table and a chair, and you can make them see whatever you know whatever you want them to see, right? So it's 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 a complicated thing, but you you know. Not sure we've answered your questions. Uh, <laughs> any other questions from the live? You sketch, a, you sketch an outline oh, and trust the great. reader. I love that. You sketch an outline and trust the reader to fill in with their own experience and their own imagination what goes within that hole a, a lot of the time too. You know, I, I don't and, think that that's that's. I think that's a mandatory part of being a successful writer. You have got to engage the audience sufficiently that they can both fill in the blanks where they see them out of their own heads, either through imagining it or through what you shaded the story with, or they create it for themselves in the way that they see it. That's why I don't think that large descriptions of hair color, eye color, so on and so forth for every single character is a particularly good idea. Don't take everything away from your audience. Let your audience into the picture. Let them do some of the work. Yeah. Well, it always strikes me that it, along these lines that uh, the book that you write is actually a completely different book for everybody who reads it because of all that yeah. stuff that they're bringing yeah. to it. And that's why occasionally there's a famous story about uh, Isaac Asimov going to a uh, a class where they were teaching nightfall and he listened to the professor go on and afterwards he went up and he said well that's very interesting but i'm i'm isaac asimov and i didn't put any of that stuff in there and the professor said well i'm very glad to meet you but just because you wrote it what makes you think you know what was in it yeah <laughs> and every author every reader is filling things into your story yeah. that you may not even yes. know is there but for them it's there that's yeah right. It's a, and, and if they read that book 10 years from now, it'll be a completely different book because they'll have a completely different level of experience. Yeah, a lot of different worldviews at that point. Yeah. 
it's just, you know, it's just, it's the coolest thing, that dance between writer and reader. I love it. You know, it's the coolest thing ever. Awesome. Um, uh, any other questions from the live audience? If not, I have another one I wanted to uh, throw out. That was great. I love that. I love that roundtable discussion. So you've all written so many novels. You've all written so many books. And I know that you often, as a writer, you have 100 ideas, and then you write one of them. And you toss the other 99 onto a back burner, or you throw them away. But considering the substantial catalogs of books, stories you've all written, are there any ideas that you put aside or thought you threw away, but they came back for a future book? I can't talk. I can't talk about this because I'm talking about it tomorrow. Oh, cool! You can't have my speech early. I don't okay. want but this. Is, oh, I guess it's a really good teaser for tomorrow night's yes. keynote, right? Yeah. Yes. So then we shouldn't talk about it at all because we might we might accidentally talk about something that Terry's talking about in his. <laughs> yeah, we don't. We don't want to do that then. <laughs> so let's let's go on to a different question then, because. There's nothing worse than writing a keynote and having everybody talk about what you're talking about. I know. About. I'm sorry, Terry. I didn't mean to pick, pick that up for tomorrow. No, no. It's just one of those things that it's kind of a, a – it's I'm, – I'm talking about uh, the question that all authors get asked over and over again, the single most abhorrent question in my life, which is, where do you get your ideas? Oh. Uh, you order because from, from that program, don't you? Yeah. And they test that. <laughs> like it could be answered. Okay, well that'll be that'll be a great keynote. Okay, anyway. Uh, I had uh there, there was another question yeah. from the live audience here. Especially with the different setting. I'm curious to okay. know how much new places they visit, like if they're okay. in different places, how much that can expand the universe, or if they're all so magical. Okay. No, great, great question. So the question is, so how, how much do you rely on, and I know some of the places you've written about are fantastical, so obviously you can't have visited them anywhere but in your imagination, but how much do real world places that you have visited, lived in, uh, been to, how much do they influence the worlds that you write, whether they're real world or whether they are off-world or alternate <laughs> fantasy, et cetera. Historical. Yeah, historical. Like, are, does does actually physically going and visiting places, how much does that influence the kind of things that you end up writing about? I, I'll i take that first. Um, I live in Saskatchewan, and there's absolutely no question that the Saskatchewan landscape has influenced my writing uh, it's it's wide open. It's uh, it's an extreme climate, hot in the summer and very very cold in the winter. <laughs> one of my one of my little pet crusades over the years has been to have real cold in my books when it's really cold and not Game of Thrones TV cold, where oh we're <laughs> so freezing, but of course we have to show our heads so our ears are sticking out and you know and, and you see that stuff all the time and anybody that's lived in a really nor real northern climate knows that those people died like days ago <laughs> and their ears froze off first and their nose froze off and they lost all their toes you know so uh, there's no question that has influenced me and i do i actually use the landscape for uh, my novel mage bane which was written as lee arthur chain uh that is set totally in saskatchewan it's the this the capital city uh, there's a lake in the middle of it with the marble palace on one side the king lives in that's the saskatchewan legislative building it's like half a kilometer that away uh and uh, the north uh, north of that is another city where the university is that's basically saskatoon and the bad guy lives out in a in a valley in the and that's the capel valley so i loved using saskatchewan and and the fact i was using a real landscape that i knew i think informed the story quite a bit. now to be fair, I also put a lake of lava in the north with some mountains because I needed it, but, you know, <laughs> artistic license. <laughs> so I think it, I, and, but I think that in general, and I've, I've said other stories in Saskatchewan and in the landscape, and I think that there's no question being a prairie boy. I was born in the Me New Mexican mountains, but I don't really remember it. So I've been a prairie boy all my life. And I really think that does play into my fiction in many different places. For me, but my 
my dad traveled around when I was, I mean, I lived in so many places, um, you know, here and overseas. And um, so I was always traveling and kept on doing it after my, you know, after I left home and um, I'm always going into somewhere new. Um, and most of my books are set in real places, like real, because of the the historical part of the story is usually set in a real location. So I, I usually go to that real location, even if the things I'm writing about aren't there anymore. Um, and going to that real location, the on-site research that I do is is actually part of my process. It's not just it's not just getting the research done. It's not just I used to think it was it was simply um, you know I needed to find out you know how the light fell like where the sun rose and set and what the ground felt like when you walk on it and what kind of you know forever gathering bits of leaves and stones and taking them into pubs and asking people what they are and it's a good excuse to go into pubs but you know the all these things that i used to do i thought was just information gathering and then i realized it was my mother that actually pointed it out when we were in um in russia doing research for the firebird and she said that it's actually your it's part of your process. Your characters don't actually start talking to you until you're on the ground where they're walking. And I thought, hey, you're actually right, because I would get scenes that I would only get if I was on these different spots. And the pandemic's been really rough for me for the book that I'm doing now because I couldn't get the characters moving. I knew the the where I wanted them to go. And they start they had started talking to me before you know, before the pandemic. And I actually had to go to, you know, over to London and Scotland this past spring, all masked up and trying to keep people away from me um, to get them to go further to get to get the, the book really underway. Um, because they just they just wouldn't move in my mind until I went over there. Um, so it really is a, a huge part of my process to be on the ground walking where my characters walk. Um, which is, you know, it's rough. It's really terrible to have to travel to all these places. And, you know, you kind of start thinking, maybe maybe one in the south of France would be nice. Maybe, you know, <laughs> you start trying to think, where can I go now? But the, the um, it, it is, it's just the travel and the, the on location thing is, is a huge part for me, getting everything right. Well, I don't have any problem. I'm writing about this world all the time. Uh, I just don't happen to have it set in this time period. Everything I write about is this world in the future uh, or this, this world in your own mind or whatever. Uh, I think what's crucial for me is that it deals with subject matter, um, issues, people's concerns that exist right now. Uh, and that's always been true. So, you know, I wrote one whole set of the Shamra books about about erosion and, and the, the, the loss of magic in the world and the loss of, of uh, our system. Ha. Uh, I've written uh, a whole book about what happens uh, or a whole series of nine books surrounding one character that have to do with the fact that she is the worst of the worst, but she was taken as a child and rearranged, rebrained and so forth. And so she has killed people over and over again, but she's not that person and she's coming back. How does that happen? Wait a minute. How does it happen? Is it even possible? All these people that seek forgiveness in this world, how many of them really deserve it? How many of them do we really forgive for the things that the sins have committed or the badnesses they've done? We say we do, but you know, outside of the Bibles, and the good books that talk about this, how often does this really happen? And I wanted to find out, I'm not sure I ever found out actually, I did find out for this one character, but it's not an easy question. But for me, high fantasy, which is what I think I write, only works if we're writing about something that people can immediately identify with to be true about the world they live in. Awesome. Uh, thank you guys so much for your awesome readings, for the reflections on the writing process. Thank you, uh, live audience, for asking some great questions. And, and for the uh, audience, um, 
Okay, so there, there is one more question that's popped up from Sarah. Uh, and I'm just checking to see. Uh, there's a long, long comment. We'll see if I, I've noticed in real life names are repeated frequently. Uh, Moi is a <clears throat> Moi River, which feeds Moi Lake and features Moi Lake Park, et cetera, et cetera. And then it seems like a bad idea in a novel. What are your strategies for making up names for people, places, and things so that they are distinguishable instead of Mark and Matt, for example? They're distinguishable, pronounceable, and, 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 and not too overwhelming. Well, uh, I have people for that. <laughs> They're called family editors. <laughs> and they're quick to tell me if something doesn't work. And I, they don't care, you know, how desperately connected I am to something. If they feel it's wrong, they say so right away. And uh, I've probably had more names changed than I've had accepted over the years. I, I think that, you know, and readers will be happy to tell you what's wrong with your book. <laughs> And they will do so in no uncertain terms, especially if they are under the age of 10. <laughs> I don't have a strategy. That's that's way too highfalutin. <laughs> <laughs> I just make them up and or pick them. Or There's a whole book, uh, Taryn Segura, the second book, uh, the one that came after Mar Segura. Uh, a lot of the characters' names are the names of actors I was performing with in the production of Beauty and the Beast in Saskatoon at the time. So I told them I was doing it, and they got a kick out of it. Yeah, that's cool. I use I use. I'm an amateur genealogist. I was born into a family of amateur genealogists. Like it, I had pedigree charts on my door when I was born. Uh, so I tend to use family surnames for surnames. I go through, and you know, if they're if they're um, geographically appropriate for the people I'm writing about, I tend to use that. Um, uh, I tend to, I don't name characters if I don't have to, you know, I, I don't waste a name on a person. Um, if someone's just a, you know, a clerk, a clerk in, in, in an office, I just, you know, I just call him the clerk. I don't, I don't worry about giving him a name if he's just going to be in one scene. Um, because it's a wasting a name that I might want in a different book and B, it makes the reader think that they have to remember him when they don't have to remember him. Right. And if you attach a name to someone, the reader thinks, Oh God, I've got to remember this person. There's already a lot of people in my book. So, cause I've got dual stories going on. Um, so that's something I do. Uh, I've got, I deal with real place names. So I try to find if there are alternate spellings, I try to find the spelling that people are going to find the easiest spelling to pronounce because they're not always easy to pronounce if they're difficult to pronounce then i try to have somebody say it in the book and you know say it phonetically so that it's easy for you know someone to pick up um that you know in scotland there's a there's a town that my own ancestors came from called kirkubri which is spelled kurt cudbright um and you wouldn't know it's called kirkubri so the first time it was said in the book, I just, you know, had my my modern day character say I gave it the, the proper the proper pronunciation of, you know, and then you spell it phonetically, you know, Kirkubri. So that after that, hopefully everybody reading the book remembers to call it Kirkubri, but if they don't, it doesn't matter. Um, so there are little tricks you can use like that. Um, but it's, I, ca I can't get around the real names of people when I'm dealing with real life characters in the, in the historical part, but I can choose how many of them I put in. If somebody, you know, if I've got six Jameses, I can cull them down <laughs> and only maybe deal with like two of them. So I don't confuse people. And then I can call one Jamie and one James um, to, so that there's some differentiation between them. Uh, in the Firebird, I had like two Anns living at the same time in the same house. So I called one Nan. You can, you can create little differences that way. Uh, just little tricks you can use with people like that when you're dealing with it. But yeah, it's always a it's always an issue to try to make it. You want to be clear. You don't want to confuse your reader. You want to be clear, and you don't want a reader to to get on a name and think now how am I supposed to say that or what you know. You don't want to ever pop your reader out of the story. You just want them to go through the story and enjoy it. And anything that pops them out 
is not good. So, on the other hand, mm. I kind of like the idea of making the reader make a choice. I like the names that can be spoken in two different ways. Right. I like it when they settle on one and then they come back and they really get upset about it. <laughs> I've seen that happen, uh, strangely enough. But that's why I don't use appendices or any of that sort of thing. I want uh, readers to feel like the book belongs to them, the characters belong to them. If they want to pronounce it one way, go for it. I really don't care because I don't have any invested interest in how the characters are called, for the most part, anyway. I have occasionally been reading in my book out loud, like during a reading, and realized I don't know how to pronounce the name. <laughs> <laughs> it's only been in my head. <laughs> And it's more like a that shape than a sound. So. That happens sometimes when you get like an audiobook narrator or something call yes. you up and they're like, how do you pronounce that? It's like, I have no idea. It's just like, you know, that's, I don't know. It's just, it's just an arrangement of letters when you're working yeah, with them. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen now and then either. It yeah. happens on every yeah. single audiobook ever, I swear. Yeah. They have a whole list and they okay. say, how would you say this? And they want you to give a phonetic pronunciation yeah. and they want you to be sure you give the emphasis where they yeah. want it. I just want to throw up my hands and say, I don't care. Say it however you want to say it. Exactly. I will, just, I will just give you the freedom to go with that one and however you would like. Yeah. yeah. Besides, I don't like work. <laughs> but Kirkubri pretty much has to be Kirkubri. Otherwise, you're going to make enemies in Scotland. So I kind of like yes. to, <laughs> like well, to stay on, on the good side of the Scots always. Well, fears, fear, the fear factor is a different consideration. <laughs> Oh, man. Awesome. Um, thank you guys so much for the wonderful readings, the great discussion. For anyone watching, um, check out the When Words Collide YouTube channel or Facebook group, and you will see four amazing keynotes from these three lovely authors that I'm with, as well as Hank, Philip, and Ryan. We'll all be doing the keynotes. I'll have a stronger Wi-Fi connection and a camera that's facing directly at me as well. I want to thank you guys for joining me tonight, and I want to thank everyone in the audience here as well as at home for watching. Uh, guys, um, have a wonderful evening. Oh, thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll see and you tomorrow. Good night.